Ophiocordyceps unilateralis. This is a fungus unlike any other. It releases spores that land on nearby ants. These spores then take complete control over the ant's body, causing it to leave the colony, then to find a leaf exactly 25 centimeters above the forest floor and cling onto it with all of its strength. The fungus will then grow out of the ant and scatter more spores in the area, continuing the cycle. In the same way this fungus uses spores, we use controllers to manipulate characters in video games. They have no say over their own actions. They have no agency. They are simply husks that we control for our own amusement. Does this seem completely different from what you're used to in the Completionist Top 10 video? Great, because I had the exact same feeling trying to use almost every controller on this list. Some of these are inventive, others are simply clunky but all of them will set you back on your heels and ask, what the f dude? And to add a little extra sprinkle of nuttiness to these already nutty controllers, you should know that I am a proud owner of almost every single one of these controllers on this list. So I have actually experienced everything that I'm saying in this video, and now you're about to as well. So let's get started. These are my top 10 what the f controllers of all time. Starting with 10 being, hey, this is not so bad, to number one being, who asked for this? Let's begin. Number 10. Every famous political figure worth their salt has a musical instrument associated with them. Clinton has the saxophone. Jefferson had the violin, and Senator Donkey Kong has the bongos. The DK bongos were originally made for the Donkey Konga series, but I fell in love with them with the game Donkey Kong Jungle Beat. These drums aren't just used for rhythm, they're used for platforming and beating the ever-loving tar out of every foe that DK runs into in the jungle. You beat them like a drum. So a lot of you guys have probably have seen these bongos in action before, whether you're your favorite YouTuber or streamer or content creator, or you had a friend who had them, or you have them. And in the end, the reason why this is so low on the list is because this is actually a pretty decent controller. The technology behind all this is fascinating. You have the sensor up here that detects sound via a microphone. The bongos themselves have different pressure points for what you're trying to do, whether it be the insides or the outsides. And overall, the controller itself, the quality of these controllers, I really like, and I wanted to see a lot more games utilize this bad boy. Would I buy it today in 2020? Probably not. But you know what? You never know. You never know. You never know. Don't make anything weird, please, Nintendo. This is enough. Number nine. Now, it's no surprise when a kid's movie is trying to sell toys, right? It's almost the primary revenue stream with the theatrical release as just one long ad for all of the merch out there. Well, The Wizard was a film that was solely created to sell the Power Glove and build up hype for Super Mario Bros. 3. The Power Glove is easily the most infamous controller of all time as one of the first attempts at motion controls in video games. It was marketed harder than any other gaming thing before it, and the marketing was Worked. Kind of. The wizard made this controller seem like the raddest thing that the world had ever seen. It was used by Jimmy's video game rival, and as we all know, the coolest things are used by the bad guys. Just look at the Green Ranger's Dragon Dagger. However, it wasn't long before the people went from, I need that to, I need that to get as far away from me as possible, mom. First of all, it's a hockey glove with buttons on it. If you want to use those buttons, you have to reach over and press them on your forearm like you're using the dual discs in Yu-Gi-Oh! Now, while this looks cool initially, it's very easy for your arms to get sore. There is no way you can play a game longer than half an hour unless you rest this thing on your stomach. And then you're just giving yourself a sad hug, and even at that, it's not very friendly for your hands to use. Second of all, the motion controls were... Not great. You set up the sensors on your TV and moved your hand according to how you wanted things to move on the screen. While Nintendo said you could use this with any game, only two games were released with the intended use of the Power Glove, Bad Street Brawler and Super Glove Ball, both of which were critically panned and did not sell well at all. Now as a quick disclaimer, most of the controllers for this video I bought off of eBay or I acquired from a convention or two over the years. And for some weird reason, I couldn't find my own Power Glove. So instead, if you really want to deep dive into what the Power Glove 
love really is like, when you're done watching this video, click the link in the box down below to check out the Gaming Historian's video on it. It's incredible, and it actually shows this thing in action. But even as a lame glove, the Power Glove is iconic, appearing in numerous films and TV shows throughout the years, and I still get nostalgic whenever I see this thing. You know, I feel like this controller is best summed up by the movie it comes from. I love the Power Glove. It's so bad. Indeed it is, Lucas. Indeed it is. Number eight. One of my favorite controllers of all time is the Nintendo GameCube controller. It's completely unique. The buttons are carefully placed for your thumbs and it is just the perfect size for your hands. But what if it was bigger? And more importantly, what if it was wider? Enter the ASCII keyboard controller. This controller was created exclusively for Fantasy Star Online episodes one and two for the Nintendo GameCube, so that players could more easily communicate over the internet. And if there's one thing we all know about the Nintendo GameCube, it's that it was the console that was defined by its online multiplayer experience. Essentially, someone at the ASCII Corporation cut the regular GameCube controller in half and fused a keyboard in the middle. It's meant to make communicating with the other players easier in the online format as opposed to using a joystick to cycle through an alphabet on screen. And for that, yeah, I guess it works well. Now, unfortunately, the people at UPS, FedEx, and USPS weren't able to get me this ASCII keyboard that I paid for in time for this video, which is a shame because this controller is actually pretty expensive on its own. But I have to imagine that holding this thing like an actual controller would be stupid and weird. I would not want to play Super Smash Bros. Melee with this thing. It's obviously designed as a hybrid controller keyboard. Is it effective as a keyboard? Yeah. As a controller? Eh, I don't think so. Number seven. Nothing beats a dragon. Whether they're battling an entire army of white walkers or burninating the countryside, there's nothing more awesome than a dragon in any context. Which is why I got extremely stoked when I found this monster of a controller right here. Simply referred to as the USB Fire Dragon Gamepad, this controller is literally just a mother dragon. Don't believe me? Look at the tail sticking out. Look at those gem-like buttons and those thumbsticks. Look at the fire that's supposedly coming out of his mouth. But that's not the only reason why I love this controller right here. I got a message from the eBay seller. The person who I bought this controller, their son is a fan of the show. So to you, Ethan, hello. Thank you for your parents for letting me buy this controller from them. And I hope you enjoy this shout out. Number six. While Nintendo is certainly guilty of dabbling in weird controller designs, they often let other companies come and pitch and produce outlandish controllers to them, such was the case with Mattel and the Power Glove, and the company Brotherbund and the NES U-Force. While the U-Force looked like you were missing the other half of your game of Battleship, it was actually really advanced for the time. It shot infrared beams out of its screen in order to interpret hand movements as controller inputs. Okay, so bottom right is jump. Ah, it's okay, there should be a, no, stop. This is really rough. Whew. And I thought connect was like, kind of a piece of crap. There we go, left jab, left body, right body, right jab. Wow, this is actually pretty nice. I don't think I could get to the end of fighting Mike Tyson uh, in this way. It just seems like a huge risk. This also just seems like a really weird mechanic to... Ah, we get out of the thing! It's Glass Joe! Come on! In the end, I don't think it's a very good practical controller, but I do like the potential that it has, or rather that it had. Uh, there are a lot of gamers out there who otherwise physically might not be able to use an NES controller, really any controller out there. It gives them kind of a second and third chance in that way of learning how to play a game, which I think in any case, I think all gamers of all types should be able to play any game they want. And with regards to the U-Force, I think this was an early attempt to make it accessible to everyone. Number five. 
This year marks the return of my favorite sports series of all time, with the return of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 being re-released in just a couple of months. And I couldn't be more stoked. The Tony Hawk games are not only some of the most enjoyable games, but they allow me to connect with so many other people growing up. I was able to join my friends in Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2 in the discussion and feel like I was just as gnarly as all of those awesome skaters. So, how do you undo all of this? By creating a game around a peripheral that removes the heart of the game and flat out doesn't work. Enter Tony Hawk Ride and the skateboard that comes with it. This game received unanimous negative reviews with the main reason being this damned peripheral controller thing. This thing was so reviled, it was even used by Games Radar as the trophy for the worst games of the year list in 2009. These things were everywhere. People thought this was going to be the craze. I'll tell you, out of all the things that I bought on eBay, this was the cheapest at a whopping $15. I feel bad for everyone who made this, knowing that I got this for $15. If it's as bad as I think it is, we're gonna find out right now. It was based completely around motion controls so you could actually feel like you were on a skateboard. Only, no one wanted to actually be on a skateboard they just wanted to play Tony Hawk games. Not to mention, this game wasn't a one-to-one -one recreation of skateboarding. For example, if you wanted to ollie, you would lift up the front of the board into a manual quickly. But if you wanted a manual, you would do the same thing, but slowly. So a lot of you are probably wondering, Hey Gerard, where's the embarrassing footage of you trying to do a kickflip and eating shit while on the skateboard? Well, it turns out that this skateboard doesn't work. In fact, Several of the skateboards I purchased don't work and I swapped them out individually. This device will not connect to my Xbox 360 and thus I cannot even play the game as this screen that you see right now actually prevents me from moving forward. So I guess what I could say to you guys is this is about as far as I got with personally experiencing Tony Hawk Ride. And now this board that you see right here is only good as an armrest. Yay. Number four. Nintendo is famous for their family-friendly nature and making games that everyone can enjoy. So when a game comes out for a Nintendo console that is more mature, it's kind of alarming. And while I was surprised that Resident Evil 4 released on the GameCube, I was even more shocked by the controller that came with it. Now this thing is a chainsaw splattered with blood. Holy sh**. It's based on the Chainsaw Man, a character who wears a burlap sack over his head and chases after Leon with a warm glass of milk and a hug. And by warm glass of milk and a hug, I mean a mother chainsaw. This bad boy is pretty expensive in the market depending on which controller you buy. This is the PlayStation 2 version. Personally, I found that in my research, the PS2 version looked a little bit nicer, a little cleaner mostly because it probably was manufactured several years after the fact the GameCube one was. Right here, there's a little slot uh, to pull out this little holder for, it looks like a manual. So this actually is a thank you note uh, in several different languages, and it tells you how to assemble the controller. So it's an instruction manual on how to build the controller properly. It what? I didn't even know this. There is a motion control aspect built into this thing with the chainsaw. Ooh boy, look look how you hold this thing. It's a very fascinating way of doing it. Oh, okay. L2 is right here, R2 is right here. Very weird choice in placement. This controller is really cool. It's dumb, but it's really cool. And now I have it. Number three. One of the most popular things to do in a controller department is to just slap a logo or a picture of the main character on it and call it a day. Nintendo is exceptional at this, but unless you're a Jack-specific plug-and-play kind of game, you don't actually want to have a character as a controller. That seems ridiculous. Well, Dragon Quest seems to disagree. This is the slime. Those of you who don't know, a slime is one of the weakest and most common enemies of the Dragon Quest franchise. They're small, weak, and they're just so darn cute. They're just a little small dollop of happiness and have been an RPG icon for decades. But wait, I hear you say. That's a cute little figurine. Where's the controller? An excellent question. It's right there. Yep, it's on its butt. The slime is gross. Now here's the deal. I saw this controller at a convention about two years ago in Arizona, 
and I'd never seen it before. And I bought it thinking one day, one day I will make a video in which I showcase this controller. And that day, my friends, is today with the biggest asterisk of all time. When I opened it, as you guys may have saw in the B-roll footage, it was in plastic. We opened it up and this thing is so sticky. It is so gross. The plastic, I think, melted into the controller. It is so gross. Even doing this feels gross. I can't hold this thing. I, I wanted to showcase what this thing is in its capacities of what it is. You have L2 and R2 on the top, L1 and R1 right here. God, this feels so gross. The analog sticks are over here and they, it just feels weird. This controller is meant for the most truest and slimiest of Dragon Quest fans. Now, the, the weird thing about this controller, feeling it now and sticking this aside, look how I hold it. This is how you play a game. This doesn't feel comfortable. It like feels like you're holding a traditional Xbox uh, regular controller, the original Xbox controller, which is not bad, but the spherical design of it just doesn't make sense to me. And all I can say is that this top 10 has been all about my personal experience. And so far, this is the stickiest controller I've ever held in my entire life. And I am holding it like an Oscar. Don't get me wrong. I'm holding it well. I hate that I'm holding it. It's gross. Number two. Do y'all remember the ad campaigns for the Kinect? They said that you were the controller and that we were finally going to have a full body gaming experience, claiming the state of video games as we know it was going to change forever. Remember how awkward that thing actually ended up controlling? Well, Microsoft was not the first company to make that promise and not fulfill it. For that, we have to look to Sega in 1993. The Sega Activator was created to fully experience fighting games. Basically, you now have the ability to have your punches and kicks match up with the kicks and punches of the characters on screen. The commercials showed people flat out doing martial arts in order to defeat enemies in games like Eternal Champions and Mortal Kombat. Except that's not at all how the Activator works. What you would do is place this giant octagon on the ground. Each side emitted an infrared beam straight into the air. Now this tech might sound familiar as it's the same idea that was used for the NES U-Force earlier on this list. The weirdest thing about this is that there are two start buttons and they have to be activated at the same time to approve it. So if I want to activate start, I have to do this. Did it work? Test your might. So this over here, if I kick this, is my only kick button. This is block. It's all blocking and walking backwards. All right, I'm done, this sucks. Number one. There are a ton of controllers based off of weapons out there. The most common ones you'll see are different kinds of guns that are meant to be used as light guns in games. You know, your time crises, your house of the deads, etc. But the gun controller I'm talking about today that is number one is not intended to be used with a shooter. Oh no, it's meant to be used for an RPG, let alone one of the most prolific people who create the most iconic RPGs of all time. Ladies and gents, you have seen the weird, you've seen the wonderful, you've seen the impractical, and you've seen the traditional. So what is number one? What is the number one WTF controller that I was able to get my hands on? Well, my friends, it's all about Lady Yuna and her wonderful guns. The Tiny Bee Controllers, I say controllers because it comes in two parts, is an exact replica of Yuna's guns from Final Fantasy X-2, and that really surprised me. I mean, look, I love Final Fantasy, let alone Final Fantasy X, but when I think of Final Fantasy, these guns are not the first weapons I think of. Heck, these aren't even the first weapons I think of for Yuna herself. And if you're asking yourself, why does Lady Yuna have two guns and dresses up in a girl band and performs? The answer is I have no idea. I have played the game many a time. But what I will say 
is that I had to, without a shadow of a doubt, have these guns. Holy crap. These things feel real. Oh my goodness. Look at this. Look at this. There are no buttons. There's barely any buttons on this guy. Analog stick, D-pad. Button one, button two, button three, button four. These guns are not light guns. They're standard controllers, which begs the question. <clears throat> a very important question. Are you all listening? Here we go. And that question is, who f***ing wanted these things? Like, seriously, who the f*** was going, oh man, Final Fantasy X-2, one of the first sequels to a Final Fantasy game. Let's make it about the main character who saved the world and became a pop star. And you know what? Let's give her guns. No, let's give some guns up in here. Let's let the player own some guns for a standard f***ing RPG. And let's make the guns f***ing incredible, but cumbersome in a weird way. Who said these statements I just made up? Buy them a mansion. Someone please buy them a mansion. It's motherfucking huge plays, my dudes. These are what you use for every other button on a standard PS2 controller. But none of them are labeled, so you have to learn them through trial and error. And it's likely a lot of error, as while you play, your hands will constantly be moving around the controller trying to find the right button to press. Your hands will last about 15 minutes tops because these weigh similarly to actual guns. Your arms are going to get tired. I did this exact thing and the only thing keeping me going was making sure I understood what the f I was doing while holding these super unnecessarily high quality guns. With every controller on this list, I can either point an example of how this was done better later on, or how I could come up with better ways to implement the button placement myself. However, I am at a loss as to how you can approve anything here. Because legit, these controllers are the mother Mona Lisa of gaming, my friends. But as a controller, they're kind of a complete failure. I think that's why they included the stand so you can fucking look at the expensive ass thing you just bought like you're at an art museum. This is a boppet that is unwieldy to hold, difficult to understand, and even defeats the purpose of the game they were designed for. I did one damage. And it's because of all of this that Final Fantasy X-2, the Tiny B controllers, are my most what the f controller of all time. And the best part is, I now own them.